All right, full sail. Let's put our hands together for our moderator, Ann Russell. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for those of you guys who are joining us here live today, and for those of, of you who are watching online. We are very excited to do this panel with our guests. Um, again, my name is Ann Russell. I am the program director for the film uh, production MFA program here at Full Sail. And uh, we are going to be <coughs> doing the, uh, the session called On Global Opportunities in the Entertainment Industry. And the guests we have that I'd like to welcome to the stage is uh, Bryce Hellman, uh, Jordan Young, DJ Swivel. I don't know if you go by, you go by Jordan, right? Okay. And then um, Ashish Manchanda. So please give a big hand for our guests. So I'd like to start off just or letting them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about uh, what you know, part of the industry they work at and what uh, degree program they went through here at Full Sail. And Bryce, let's start with you. Sure. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Bryce. I'm a still somewhat recent show production grad. I graduated in 2012. Uh, my job title is a realist at a recent startup with me and my business partner called Forward Thinking Designs. Uh, I always kind of have to explain what a realist is. Uh, I first explained that my business partner is the chief of big ideas, and sometimes I have to say I'm the realist because I kind of have to bring him down to what's actually feasible when we do a project. But it's a glorified title for an engineer, so I kind of do it all. All right. Cool. Uh, I'm Jordan, uh, DJ Swivel. Uh, I make music, and uh, I've now entered the tech space uh, in music tech with uh, my company, Skio Music. Good morning. So we have a company called Flying Carpet Productions. Uh, did work in the US for about seven, eight years after I graduated in 97. I set up this company in India and my wife and I produce uh, music, audio, and now video content. Yeah, and uh, in fact, we are looking to go global and <laughs> we've, we've done work in India and looking to come back to the US now. And what uh, Jordan and Ashish failed to mention is that they are both inductees this year into our Hall of Fame. So let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. That's awesome. So I um, wanted to start off first with uh, with the um, with the fact that both uh, Jordan and Ashish, you both are international students, correct? You guys were international students when you're here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, can you guys talk a little bit about what was your decision in coming to the U.S. or coming to to Florida to study at Full Sail? Would you like to start? Sure. So uh, back in India, there was at that time there was only one institute, the Film Training Institute uh, in a city called Pune, uh, which is also called Oxford of the East. But um, and uh, but they required you to have a degree in uh, in physics, chemistry, and maths, or an engineering degree before you came to do a course in uh, uh, recording engineering. Yeah. And I had just passed out high school, and I was like, gosh, that's going to be one, two, three, four, like five years later. You know, and I'm going to, and I cannot wait five years, you know, to do this thing. Uh, so what, there, were, there wasn't any other place that you could go and really learn uh, music production, show production, live production, video production. And uh, I chanced upon a mix magazine. And, you know, there was this little ad in there which said, you know, we take your dreams seriously. And I was like, hmm, interesting. For an impressionable mind, those are big lines. So, I mean, I give huge credit to John Phillips to come up with that and their team to, you know, really catch our minds fancy and uh, started corresponding with Full Sail, like with many other universities of the time, and found that Full Sail offered uh, lots of exposure, lots of equipment, and uh, they had a really good track record with graduates doing uh, wonderful stuff in the industry. So for us back home, we were in, um, I would speak about like my friends and I, very influenced by Western culture, you know, uh, pop, rock, and uh, all the music, oh, you know, over the decades has been very influential for a growing mind. And I started realizing that American music has penetrated the entire planet and has impacted it in some way or the other. So there's something that the Americans are doing which is very interesting, and I don't know what it is. So I started the journey to explore ways of coming here, and uh, yep, so over a period of time, Full Sail seemed to be the only choice, and uh, that's how I came to Full Sail. Wow, that's a great story. How about you, Jordan? Um, for me, uh, I, I obviously love music in high school, uh, and I, so I was DJing and, and had uh, 
some production background. I was making tracks or whatever. And uh, I applied to the more popular school, this is cutting out, uh, in Ontario. I was from Toronto. Uh, the school was called Fanshawe, and I didn't get into their music program. Uh, they only allowed 60 students a year, and uh, I wasn't the best high school student. I was very average. Uh, so I didn't get in, so I went and did a year of regular college, and I realized that I hated it, and I didn't want to uh, go through three more years of it. Uh, so then I had already known about Full Sail, uh, and I originally wanted to go to Full Sail, but I just thought it was too expensive, it was too far, all the, all the challenges and hurdles with moving to another country by myself. Uh, and then after that year of college, I realized it was really the only option. So um, uh, I came down, I just figured it out. Yeah. yeah. And Bryce, how about for you? I mean, uh, what was your decision, kind of your impetus for coming to Full Sail? I've always had an interest in, in shows. Uh, even even as a little kid, we'd go to a show, and it, it, it was kind of a thing between my older brother and I. We'd sit there and just stare at the lights. And afterwards, like my parents and I were like, what do you think of the show? And it's like, well, the lighting was awesome. <laughs> and it's like, no, like the show. And it's like, it sounded great. And it's like, <laughs> never mind. So like even from a young, young age. And then when I got into high school, I was actually the senior lighting designer for all the productions that happened on our stage. I would get pulled out of class in high school to like go program something or go you know, walk, walk some talent around the stage and be like, this is our facility, because none of the instructors knew. Uh, so then that was kind of like, I, this is what I want to do. I want to get into, uh, you know, technical theater. That's what I was calling it, you know, all the way throughout high school. It's looking at technical theater or, you know, a theater-related degree, but it was all like theater performance. And I'm like, I can't, I couldn't ever find something that spoke to the niche that I was after. Mm -hmm. And one day, one of my friends says, you know, I'm going, I'm looking at the school in Orlando for, for film. He, he wanted to be a film director. And he said, he says, called Full Sail. And I was like, that's an unusual name. So I, I checked it out. And just after looking at the website, I'm like, I, I have to get there. Like, I have to look at this. And it just so happened we were at Disney and we came up here for the behind the scenes tour. And just when the lights faded out and the intro video hit, you know, uh, the first five minutes of the day, my mom looks at me and she's like, you have to go here. And I'm like, I know, like, <laughs> you're late. I already came to that conclusion. Like, so, so it, it was, that happened in 10th grade. And like my admissions reps were like trying to pull me out of high school in 11th grade to get here. And I'm like, I wish I, I got to graduate first. So, you know, <laughs> give, give me a minute, I'll be there. And, uh, you know, came straight down here and, and it's no looking back. It, it was an awesome ride. And but I knew from, from a young age that this is what I wanted to get into. Yeah. So um, did both, uh, Jordan, did you and Ashish, did you guys both think you were going to, you know, come to school here as an international student and then return back to your homes to then work in the industry there? Or was, was ever that part of your intention with studying at a, at a, for, at a foreign university? Um, I, I didn't at all. I, I came down knowing that music happened in New York or LA. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I, I knew that reality, and, and um, that was a process in itself, going to New York and getting the, the visa, and then keeping a visa, and, and, uh, uh, and all that. But yeah, I knew I wasn't going back to Toronto. Okay, interesting. Mm, my approach has been more global, that uh, we want to be everywhere. You know, I um, uh, wanted to work in, uh, in the US, and uh, you know, like Sybil said, you know, New York and LA were the places where the action is happening where the action is. And, uh, but also in India, there's a lot of action. So I didn't want to miss out on the action back home. And uh, though I got a good kickstart over here, I hadn't made uh, that much progress in India because I'd left by then when I came to Full Sail. So I decided at some point, uh, much to the display of my mentors, that I'm going to go back to India, set up my base, get the company going. Once we kind of get established, then we're going to go back. And, uh, and that's what we're doing right now. So. Uh, definitely wanted to be in a couple of territories. You know, uh, we love Scandinavia, and we're going to be there too. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> well, that's a good, that brings up a good point, Jordan. How much uh, international work are you doing? How much traveling are you doing for what you do? Uh, I travel a lot, actually. Uh, it's not necessarily always for work, but I mean, <laughs> I, I like traveling. <laughs> um, uh, for work, I have traveled. Uh, uh, B took me to Australia and, and London and, and a few places like that. Um, most of the traveling for music stuff is within the U.S. And, and I've actually done some work in Toronto, oddly enough, that had nothing to do with me being from Toronto. <laughs> um, 
but uh, yeah, most of the traveling is, is locally here. And then a couple of times I've, I've uh, done the international stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then with Skio, my, my tech company, I've, I've done some traveling, uh, both US, Canada, and also uh, Europe. Interesting. So, yeah. And, and Bryce, how about you? Um, when you were studying here and you knew you wanted to do uh, show pro, um, did, you, did you know, oh gosh, I'm gonna go work uh, globally because um, you, know, you do in fact work a lot globally, right. correct? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, I haven't actually done any projects in the US uh, <laughs> ever since I got hired. It's, I think I did a small, like one or two designs. One, one project that was actually here in, it was a museum in Michigan. I just did the programming for that, but. I did the programming in a hotel room in China as I was there for another project. So haven't really done much here. It's all global opportunity. But I never really thought that I'd have that opportunity. Uh, I'm the first family member in four or five generations to get out of the northern side of the country. So I grew up in Ohio. My aunt, she lives in Michigan, but she's like the only other person outside the state of Ohio. Oh. So this was a big deal coming, branching away from the clan, if you will, and coming down to Orlando for college. And I thought that was great. I'm just like, wow, I'm in Orlando. Like, I love it here. All the all the themed entertainment and you know all the production that happens here in Orlando. I'm like, I love it here. And career development set me up with the opportunity to reach out to this job, and where I got hired at my first job. And they're an international company. And the first project was a theme park in China. And it was that was the opportunity. That was my big break. Wow. And I never expected that. So anytime I travel, anytime I get on a plane, I'm like. I never thought I'd be getting on a plane to the other side of the world. I never thought it'd happen. Wow, that's great. Do you, and, and so a lot of your early work was in um, conjunction with a company. People, you were hired, correct? Correct, and yes. You, and then now as you own your own company, do you still consult for those international companies? That's correct. Actually, uh, our, our business strategy is to be a partner uh, with other integrators here in the Orlando, Florida area. So we're not necessarily trying to go after clients of our own. We want to be a partner with all these other international opportunities and fill where they have a need. And that's kind of the way the themed entertainment industry goes is uh, anytime there's a large project, it's, it's companies bringing other companies to the table. There'll be a master planner that, that starts designing a, a park or, or a installation or what have you. And then they say, you know, I know, I know a good general contractor and they bring them in. And the general, the general contractor says, you know, I know a good theming company and they bring them in. And the theming company says, I know a good AV company and they bring them in. So we're kind of all just writing each other's coattails through the industry, but that's a good business strategy for us is we, we're not trying to compete with anyone because we want to be part of the, the projects that everyone else is doing. Mm. Do you find, Ashish, since you've probably been out the longest from the from the different from full sale, graduating from full sale, do you find that the global industry market has shifted at all in the years since you've been, you know, working? Shifted as in shifted, uh, meaning that is it become more global? Uh, have you seen that? Have you oh, seen yes. opportunities maybe arisen that wouldn't have arisen when you started? Uh, that's uh, I think more because of the internet and. Uh, the digital rev uh, revolution is just because of that. Because I think it's brought, <coughs> its content can be viewed anywhere by anybody now. It's just the mechanics of the business side of it. How is it going to be monetized successfully? And uh, region-wise distribution, you know, which uh, has to be, I guess, more formalized. Mm. And the legalities have to be sorted out in more efficient ways, which, you know, which Civil is doing, actually. Uh, so for audio, video content, I think it's a great time that you have a, you have a, your clientele is global today, you know, so you could be sitting anywhere, you know, you could be sitting on your island, or you could be sitting on your farm, or you could be sitting in a major city, it doesn't matter. You just have to know how to get out, uh, get your material. Tell me more about this island thing. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. So, um, so, do you find Jordan in your experience of uh, you know doing gigs in different places around the world? Do you find that the markets are different much, or do you find that there's sort of the same call for the entertainment, the same call for sort of your specific job and what well, you do? Well, as an engineer or producer or whatever I'm doing, uh, when I'm traveling with an artist, it doesn't really change because it's a U.S. based. I'm just happen to be traveling with that artist, uh, so I, I'm I haven't really done a ton of international work where I'm going and working with someone in a different country. Gotcha. Uh, generally, I, I have mixed a number of things for people who are in different countries, but I don't go there. Right. They just 
they either come to me or they'll send me the files and, and the internet's an amazing thing. We can, I don't ever have to meet a client. That's true. Which sometimes is a great thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really experience uh, much of that having to travel and then uh, at least not on the music side in right. some business things. Um, but it would seem that <clears throat> the collaboration opportunities is so much greater when you get to work with people, you know, halfway across the world, even if you're not physically there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's part of what we're doing with, with Skio. And I don't know if any of you guys were on any of the other panels and I've talked about it a little bit, but we're essentially creating a music licensing marketplace and that's a global thing. Mm -hmm. So now you can create contracts with people in other countries and, and, uh, other locales and, and, uh, not have to worry about, uh, having your lawyers there and their lawyers there and all that, we, we sort of just can connect two p parties and allow them to make a deal and, and create content. So Yeah, that seems like, um, and she should probably can speak to this a little bit more, but that does seem to be a big, you know, from maybe 20 years ago, uh, the difference between then and now is that there's so many governmental, you know, regulations, industry regulations that for people to go and actually work abroad and to do all that kind of stuff, especially, you know, if you're American trying to go to Europe or, you know, um, those kind of things. It's And now it's like, it's, you know, it, because of the internet, as you were saying, that there's not that, you don't necessarily need to do all of that as much. Yes, but I think the regulatory, the regulatory bodies would like to do that because that's how they stay in business. You know, it's like uh, un if Dolby doesn't come up with something interesting really fast, they'll be out because you can mix, and we've like mixed movies in our bedrooms and we've released it and they've enjoyed great success and there's no Dolby encoding, you know, so it's become very democratic. Technology has moved way faster than the people who are organizing businesses. Then they are, they're, they've not been able to keep up with it. Like Napster came in and the record industry just couldn't keep up with the technology. They did not know what to do with the technology. They kind of did not even think of embracing the technology. And I think everybody lost out a decade long battle, you know, and uh, what a waste of time. But um, but I think if the business side keeps up with the technology, and I, I think that's happening now better because everything is democratic. Because first, information was very uh, privileged. It was very hierarchical, okay? So you had to work your way through to get access to certain information. Mm -hmm. Today, everybody has access to the information. Everyone, whether uh, when you're starting out and somebody who's finished, everybody has access to the same Everything. Yes, there are still certain privileges, and there's still there there is a hierarchy, but it's very uh, it's grayed out now. It's not as clearly defined. Uh, so um, it's a challenge from the business side and the people who are going to monetize content, you know, for you to stay in business. It's so easy to make it free. Everything can be free, but there has to be certain a certain discipline uh, engaged. Otherwise, you cannot have a living. You cannot. You'll still have to do some other daytime job to then you know give away music for free or your video content for free so i think that uh, there will definitely need to be some kind of um, formality that needs to come in but it has to be flexible and ha it has to evolve with the times and that's what i mean uh, civil is doing that's what we are trying to do ourselves to see how that can happen in the electronic era because that's the way to go but we have to keep up with the technology much faster than we are able to keep up with it right now. Right. I think everybody has that problem. <laughs> I, I want to follow up to the, this whole digital revolution and the, and the uh, opportunity of knowledge and, and sharing knowledge, especially on, a, on the global stage. Most of my work so far has actually been in China, where they're behind the Great Firewall. It's very much a real thing. I go there. I can't get to any of my emails because they're all in Gmail. <laughs> Google's blocked. Can't get to Facebook. Mm -hmm. Half the Internet is blocked. And, and it's really frustrating, especially for, for me in the technology field. I can't even Google a tech, technology problem because you can't find any information on technology. But the whole reason why I was even brought over there is because they have a themed entertainment installation. They want to bring in specialists from the other side of the world, from the Western world, because they want to see what Western technology is. They want to bring in specialists who know these technologies and provide it to this installation here in China and educate their people. So it, it's been a really awesome opportunity for me to be going over to the eastern side of the world, to East Asia, and being able to work with them and saying, this is the way the rest of the world is doing it, basically. This is the Western world mentality of how we use technology, how we 
uh, work with content, how they create content, uh, and that's that's been very very awesome to see. There was a installation we did in China, in fact, that all the content was actually from a uh, production company in India. I forget which which particular one, but even they had their own influence in in China then. And it was, it was kind of cool to see all these parties coming together. There was one integrator. Um, there were some Australians there. There were some South Africans there. Uh, the content creators were Indian. We were American. And this is a theme park in China. There were so many languages happening in the same room. <laughs> it was mind blowing. So, so now you need. Uh, so here's an opportunity. You need to develop like the Star Trek, uh, the communicator. Yeah, you know, the language. Uh, what do you call that? Uh, yeah, exactly. The, the yeah, the language. Yeah, 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 yeah we, need, we need we need you know t a piece of technology that can do real time tr translation. Yeah, yeah. it saves so much time, <laughs> so much headache probably too. So save so many misunderstandings. What fun? Well, you know, Bryce. Um, speaking on that, how important uh, do you feel it's been for your success to be sort of cognizant of other cultures and mm. you know, do you speak other languages? I learned a lot of Mandarin living living in China. Yeah, so That's I'm impressive. I'm very rusty, so I won't speak it because uh, it's it's embarrassing. They laugh at me every time I open my mouth over there. But I think we should hear him say something, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Come on, just something small, just a word. <laughs> um, well, so the the joke that I always say is. Um, which means I can understand Mandarin, but I can't speak it. And they, they all laugh at that. They think that's the funniest thing. <laughs> oh, he's very excited. That sounded great to me. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've learned quite, quite a bit. Um, very impressive. Yeah. So I can, I can kind of fend for myself, but I mean, going over there, I could just say, Ni hao and, xie. and that's the only things I could say, and, which means hello and thank you. And after a year, now I can go to a restaurant by myself and order and get everything I need and totally take care of everything. And, uh, but wow. learning the language is, is one part, but learning the culture has been an entirely different thing. It's such a mind-blowing experience. And, and for me, this is the thing that I'm really grateful to have the opportunity. Unlike Ashish, who's been trying so hard to get into the U.S., I've been trying so hard to get out of the U.S. because I want this other culture, much like I'm sure you can relate. You want to experience this other culture and see what it's like you know, in other parts of the world. And I totally encourage everyone, if you get the chance, to leave the country, try to do a project, try to tour, try to do something outside the U.S. because this other culture will just blow your mind. And what I learned, especially in the themed entertainment industry, is how much storytelling doesn't really work in China. <laughs> they're not about the story, they're about the wow factor. They want it big and loud and impressive and very high energy all the time. I've worked with several scripts, with several um, uh, creative people trying to put on a live production and they want this very dynamic, very moving story and then, you know, here's here's this low point where we start building suspense and we let it fall and we rise to the climax and the Chinese people are like, this is so boring. I, I, they didn't get it because they want high energy all the time and we're just like, this is new to us as Americans. We are all about the story here. Wow. So that was mind blowing to me. But then there, there are several other even technical things. We did uh, a giant nighttime show during the grand opening of the theme park that, that I was helping build. And we finished the show and it's like, great, you know, there's the last bang of the firework and then we bring back BGM nice and even and, you know, we have this nice quiet walkout and the stage manager just starts screaming, where's the VO? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she was like, she was like you have to have an announcement saying it's over. And I'm like, $50,000 worth of fireworks just went up. Like, you couldn't tell that that was a finale? I'm sorry. And she's like, no, she said, in our culture, you know, this is how we do it. And I'm like, I... I had no idea, and I'm like, well, I played all the VOs I was provided with, first of all, but secondly, <laughs> like, you know, this, that was just a moment of just like, I had no idea how- That was your wow moment. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was just totally different, standing there in the middle of the room, and I'm the only person that speaks English other than the stage manager, <laughs> and, and I mean, the, I wasn't really prepared for that. You know, we go into this show, and it's like, I know that I'm, start, I'm kicking things off because I'm the audio guy. So all the other cues follow the audio cues of the music. So I'm the guy pressing the go button tonight. And, you know, we're all standing there and the, and the countdown's happening. They're, they're just like, Ethan, Joe, Ethan, Joe. And I'm like, oh, crap, uh, I think that means one minute. Okay, I'm one minute to go. And then it's like, here we go. You know, they, they start counting down. Wu, su, san, r, e, Joe. And I was like, 
Joe sounds like go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> these are things I wasn't really prepared for, but it's like you're in a, you're not in Kansas anymore. So <laughs> here we go. Uh, that it all just kind of jumps at you all at once, and then you know, slowly. Then after I was there for for more and more months, it, you know, I started getting used to the language and used to the cultural differences. But it, it's different out there. It's oh. awesome. Yeah. Have you found that that has changed when you've gone to work then on in other places on other things how you approach them? Absolutely. Well? Even even from the po the political standpoint of how we deal in meetings with our clients and things like that. Oh, gosh. Uh, so this was all of that was my first project. That was my first job, my first project out of full sale. And it's a theme park nonetheless where I was wearing multiple hats and I had 80% responsibility of making the park work. Uh, there were days that the client says, you know, if music's not working, if, if no VOs, if there's no VO to announce that the park is opening, the park's not opening. <laughs> and like we had some, some system stability issues, you know, I was feverishly trying to work out. Let me tell you, mul multiple back-to-back 20-hour -back days, they're not fun, but sometimes they're necessary. Mm -hmm. And so there we are. And like I knew that it's like if I don't go to work today, the park doesn't open. Like I got to get there. So like that that was crazy to think about. But then everything I learned through that first experience when we went on to our second project in China later that same year, it's like I kind of knew what to expect. Now we know how to not just introduce ourselves, but get to know our client and and earn their trust and work with them through the entire process of we're, you know, here's our blueprints and here's an empty construction site. We're gonna get this all the way up and running. How to move with them through that entire experience. So I, I've been able to take the, the, the knowledge of working with someone else in another language and another culture and translate that to some of the other cultures I've been part of. Very cool. Yeah. So Jordan, how is it for you? So if you're, if you know, if you're sitting, you know, in your sound studio in the U.S. and you've got a client that you're working with abroad, how much uh, cultural, you know, problems are there or language problems? Do you come across, or do you find that when you work that way, there's a difference? No, I find most people who I work with, if they're international, uh, speak English, and yeah, yeah, I've never actually had to encounter that. I just, it's all emails and yeah, every once in a while a Skype phone call if they really want to. Talk. <laughs> I mean, music is the international language, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, some clients are a little more picky, and, so, and some clients are are a little easier. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't really have to deal with that too much. That's By the way, we should just send Michael Bay over there. He'd be really. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 They would love any Michael Bay film. Just yeah. Constant fire going on. That's. They're no, all about that. No story. Just all explosion. Yeah. Exactly. It, it explains a lot about their cinema too. Actually. Yeah. yeah it does. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yep. How about for you, Ashish? How much has cultural sort of uh, sensitivity played in, in your success? I guess India, um, coming out of the British rule, you know, so uh, growing up in urban India, we've all learned to speak English. So we kind of uh, always had two cultures that we've lived. So we've had a very strong Indian culture and we've had a pretty strong Western culture. So it wasn't so uh, difficult to adapt to another English speaking country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whether it was England or it has been America, it's been uh, pretty okay. It's been pretty okay. It's the other way around, I guess. When uh, like <laughs> like the experiences we just heard. So I think when people come into India, they have to get used to uh, dealing with Indians and the Indian way. Yeah. You know, for us, it's uh, kind of we kind of coexist. We have we can wear two hats and pretty seamlessly. But India has really, I mean, the industry in India has changed so dramatically in the last 30, 40 years. You know, especially with the global influence of Indian, um, you know, business and Indian culture on the Western Western world as well. So um, that must be that must be kind of interesting as well. So. Yeah, well, um, in India, the the film industry and the music industry is tied in. It's like the pop music of India really, uh, to me, comes out from the movies. You know, and uh, it's kind of like you have pop in America and then you have movies in America. In India, it's both of them are tied in. They work together. And outside that, there's nothing that's big. So, <clears throat> and uh, Indian movies, what's great about Indian movies, uh, like Hollywood movies, they take in influences from all over the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, the format of making the movies is kind of very, um, uh, like there's a method to make movies, but the content and ideas can come in from anywhere. So Indian movies kind of work like that. And they imbibe any popular culture, um, anything that is current, anything that is valid, 
uh, you'll find it in the movies if yeah. it if uh, if hip hop is hi- is in it'll be in some indian movie yeah. you know, if there's some a new trend or a new locale or there's some new effect that has been generated uh, it'll be in the next indian movie yeah so and of course and the content is in i mean uh, it's it's local content and the market is big you know and i think <coughs> with the people who have developed the indian film industry uh, they know how to entertain and that's what it's come down to they are very successful entertainers you know for families when they want to go out you know after a day's work and want to take your kids and themselves to get some good entertainment yeah i think indians make good uh, and entertaining uh, movies and music yeah well and and the the number of films coming out of india is just astounding i mean there's movies just made it just feels like every week there's another movie yeah, a lot of movies a lot of movies you cannot keep up with them sometimes yeah so <laughs> bryce what kind of um advice would you give to students who are interested in working abroad or exploring you know their industry and in other mm. cultures yeah the i think the best advice that i could give is the advice that i received uh just say yes is what was told to me by someone who, uh, else in the industry that was it was a colleague of mine uh, who has had several global opportunities himself. He, he, I know he went to Africa for a while. Uh, he filmed some movies in India. And he said, just say yes. Anytime you know, an opportunity comes up, whether you think it's going to get you where you want to go or not, whether you think this is a good move for you or not, whether you think you're ready or not, just say yes. And I was scared to death going over to China my first time because uh, they the company sent me alone. I was going there absolutely alone, doing stuff I've never done before. You know, it's like I've never configured a network in my life, but here I go to a factory somewhere in the middle of China, and I have to build it right there. You know, for for factory acceptance testing, and then trying to get from there down to where the the site was, uh, ended up getting lost. I missed my connection. I had no idea where I was, didn't have a working phone, didn't have, no one spoke any English. So it was really difficult. It's like, I knew, I just knew that that was going to be my luck. And I, would, I was terrified to even get on the plane in the first place. But I'm so glad I did because seven months later, you know, we opened the park and, and that's one of my biggest credits. It's like, I just had to say yes. I was terrified when someone says, do you want an all expense paid trip to China? And I'm like, oh, I don't think I'm ready. But... <laughs> I said yes, and I was. I kept being encouraged by all my colleagues, and they're just like, "Just go. You're gonna hate it. You're gonna hate being on the construction site. You're gonna hate the stress, but you're gonna be so thankful you did in the end." And I totally am. So, look, you know, look for those companies that have international in the name. That's where I started, yeah. but. Re- seriously, research a company. Look at the clients that they have. Look at the projects they've done. Look at where they want to go. Because some some companies aren't global yet, but I think most successful companies know that they have to branch out to other cultures and wrap around the globe. And if you can find a company that is willing to take those steps or that have already have some of those projects under their belt, those are the companies to really go after because that's where you're going to find your opportunity. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, coming from the film side of things, um, you know, I, I, uh, I once had a gig, I was going to go work with a German director uh, shooting in Europe, and, um, uh, and, the, and it was on a film called The Physician, and th- at the last minute, the funding that they got for the film changed, so they had to end up hiring a certain number of, of people from Europe as opposed mm-hmm. to Americans, so I ended up getting paid out and not going on the shoot because I was it was making the percentage of Americans sure, sure. working on the film over. It's it's very different in the film industry where you're working in like as an independent mm-hmm. filmmaker versus going with a company or owning a company and hiring people. But none of you guys have really ha- done that as or with or have you with your own com- company? Do you like do you deal with all the visas and all the other stuff and all the yeah. headaches and everything? Yeah, absolutely. You so, have to do that. Yeah. So right now. Uh, our current project is uh, two brand new theme parks that are currently in design. They're starting to be constructed in Dubai. Uh, so those are my my projects. I'm the lead audio system programmer for both parks, and they're opening simultaneously. So as if one park wasn't enough, now I have two of them to deal with. The one is being hailed already as the largest theme park in the world. Uh, so this is this is a great opportunity. It's crazy, but it's like you know now we have to get visas, and because it's such a large project, 
we can't just get work visas, that's not enough. I actually have to get a residency visa. Wow. So I'll be a resident of the UAE uh, just to be able to be there for so long. But with that, in order to be a resident, you have to have certain requirements. You have to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree, for instance, and you have to have all these other requirements to even be able to apply for a visa. And so there's, there's a lot of these challenges that we have to deal with. But what's interesting is, much like the film industry, sometimes we're independence as well. You know, we're, for instance, my company is a startup company, and we're subcontracting with FUNA International because that's their contract. So we're subbing in with them. But uh, in order to make some of these large projects work, we actually hire freelancers mm. uh, that are willing to say, yes, I will move to the other side of the world. So again, this comes back to just say yes. Even if you're a freelancer and someone comes to you and says, you know, hey, we're trying to do this theme park and, you know, Disney Shanghai is finishing up right now and all of the freelancers are over there. We're trying to find freelancers for Dubai coming up, there aren't any out there because they're all in Shanghai right now. So, you know, these projects happen all the time. These large scale projects, you know, we need an army uh, to be able to meet some of the deadlines that we have, especially on a large project such as a theme park. So we reach out to freelancers all the time. It's like, hey, can you go over to the other side of the world for, I don't know, seven months? And they're like, gee, let me talk to the wife. Mm. <laughs> so... Just food for thought. Just say yes. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, in like everything that we do, I mean, there's, you know, there's a handful of people doing it. And while globally that exponentially grows, if you're adding on, you know, all these other countries and the people that do the same thing yep. in different countries, at the end, ultimately, if you're working on a huge project, you're still only going to pay picking from a certain small amount. Of exactly. People, and, right? and it comes down to knowing your skill set and you know, being good at what you do. You have to believe in yourself, but everyone has the potential to, to do great things if you believe in yourself and you can trust your own skills to learn and adapt and, and constantly keep studying, constantly keep learning. That's the big thing. Because now, you know, now that we're doing all these giant projects on the world stage, I keep, I, I've met some people over in China that were Americans, like that we had just crossed paths, like we had never met before, and we're meeting for the first time on the other side of the world, and now I'm gonna work with those same people again in these upcoming projects, just by happenstance. Some people, some, some of these people were hiring because it's like, I like that guy from that last project, we're gonna hire him again. So it's making connections, it's that whole networking thing that keeps, you know, everyone keeps talking about, totally a thing. Yeah. So, uh, Jordan, what advice would you give students who are interested in maybe working in music or working in the global market? Um, well, how many of you are doing music? Oh, a lot. Okay. Are any of you from other countries? So, okay, so there's a few international students. I mean, the biggest advice I have if, if you want to work in music is, one, the market, it's really there's limited cities, uh, if you want to do what I did, uh, recording and mixing and, and things like that, uh, you really have to be in LA, um, not really, I mean, New York has sort of fallen off a bit, uh, Nashville. So uh, my advice was just, you know, what I did, I, I went and got my visa that the school provided me with, it was a one year student visa, and, and I just went and started working. And um, there's sort of a path uh, to get, now I have a green card, I've, I've been here for 11 years, so, uh, but there's a path to get there, and, and uh, it's difficult sometimes, uh, the lawyers are expensive sometimes, but uh, for me, I, I knew that I couldn't really go back to uh, Toronto, there, there wasn't much of a music business there, uh, there actually, oddly enough, is now, because uh, we've had some, some uh, success, but uh, at the time, there wasn't. So you get your student visa, you go, you, you work, you find a job for a year, you find somebody who's willing to sponsor that next visa. Um, and then I think the next one is an F1, I believe, and, and uh, that's a pretty easy one to get. Uh, and then from there, you just got to start building up your credits. I mean, this was the path that I took is, all right, let me make sure I can get enough work in this next 18-month visa so that I can get the next graduated visa, which is an O-1, which is a little more difficult to get. And then after that, you had to do a little more work and, and eventually get the green card. So, I mean, that was the path I took, and, and uh, it, especially for, for music, it's really in the U.S. is where you want to be if that's the type of music you want to work on. I mean, if you're coming from India, there's obviously a big market over in India and, and the UK, and I mean, there's other international markets, but if you want to be here working with American artists, then uh, move to one of those cities and, and uh, just get it done, I guess. How much did Full Sail help you with all of sort of that launching of your career? Because, you know, I mean, everybody that 
is from a different country knows America is very, very difficult to get work in and stay and be able to get. And I'm Canadian. We're like the, we're your hat, right? Yeah. Uh, it, should, like, it should be easier. It wasn't it, that easy. Yeah, it should be easier, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, um, but, but you make it sound easy. So, <laughs> so, so how much was Full Sail instrumental in maybe helping you with that? Or did you kind of have to figure it out yourself? Or um, you know? Well, Full Sail was... Uh, help Jessica Alloy Smith. She was my international. She's not here anymore, but um, uh, she got me my J1, which is the student visa. It's basically the one year after you graduate, you get a year. Uh, you get a year to figure it out. So she sorted that out for me. I didn't really have to do anything. She was awesome. And then, um, uh, and then I got a lawyer in Toronto, who a really fantastic uh, international uh, immigration attorney or whatever, and uh, and he sort of helped out with. Uh, the next stage and the next stage. And he, he actually brought me, fr like, got all my visas. And I went through four visas. Oh, wow. five, actually, five if you include the, the full sale one. I had two O1s. I finally got the green card. I had J1 and F1. So f five visas. Wow. Um, yeah, so for me, you, you're going to have to find an international lawyer. I don't know, maybe full sale has uh, 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 m more support in that area for later graduates. Yeah. Uh, Jessica helped me for that year while I was on the student uh, program or student visa. Uh, and then after that, I was sort of, uh, I, I just figured it out for myself. But maybe you guys have that. I don't know it Yeah, we got a, we got a pretty strong international team now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. Um, well, how about you, Ashish? What advice would you give to students who want to work globally or? I mean, for those who want to work here, I think he said it pretty well and given you all the options where you should be and how you should go about it. Um, I think with again uh, with the internet, if you're coming to the point of uh, you're having friends and you've been to a school like Full Sail, if you collaborate with other people internationally, you can do also without traveling anymore. You don't have to pretty much go yourself. So there are ways that you can come up with tracks and do work without leaving your home. It's possible today. But yes, if you go to another territory, if you come into India, again, there is a formality. The visas are not easy for you to come into India to work there. And um, to break in is, is another thing. Through networking, you can definitely get a door. Uh, you know, you can get inside the door through introductions. But the, there is still a technical process which may not be very encouraging. You know, so it depends on how, how badly you want to be in that territory. And then if you want to be in that, then you have to figure out a way and uh, stay there. So if you want to work here, then the process is part of the deal. You know, you just have to deal with it and do it. You know, so similarly, if you have to come over there uh, to India to explore, um, yeah, I mean, if you, um, I know what worked out for me is uh, I got an extension on my M visa. I remember when on my M1 when I was here and the school helped out with that. Uh, Full Sail did a great job. And during the time when I got a gig in New York, <coughs> uh, my boss, he's an Italian um, person who ran a successful company called FNL Music. And he was willing to do my visa and get my green card and everything. But I left earlier, you know. So you kind of have to, you know, play your cards correctly, you know, where you go. And, uh, um, yeah, maybe a company that can sponsor you, that would be important because that may be your only way to get into a territory. Yeah. But then I started my company. So then what happened is then I came back on a business visa. So then I wasn't dependent on anyone else. So I could come and go as I wanted and I could work back home. And I could work here also. So that's kind of what worked out for me. And you said that um, you've kind of uh, branched off now, not just in, um, in, in India and in the US, but you're also going other places. How have you, how did you sort of decide where you were going to go? Or, you know, you mentioned Scandinavia or islands or something. Like, what is the impetus for maybe going to those places? Mm, just talent. I think what I have become today is a talent scout. So wherever I go every day, even now, I'm looking around <laughs> and uh, I'm listening to stuff, uh, watching stuff, if there's anything anybody's directed or there's some writing or there's some music or something that catches my fancy, I'm interested because I think we are today in the media arts business or the multimedia, I don't know what word to call it, but because we are going to be dealing with audio and visual content, mm -hmm. so everything is important to me and uh, great talent is right on top. So it could be anybody, it could be a student. We run a little institute back home in India, and uh, 
out of 10 artists on a record label, three of them are their current students and they're not even 18 and they're really good. And I was like, gosh, this is happening right here. And we're like going out to look for people and they've been recommending each other and say, you know what, so check out this one. Oh, that she, she's a, she's a good songwriter. Why don't you just hear her out? And I heard out that this girl, she's like, what, 18? And she comes up with the best bass lines I've heard. I mean, where did she come from? <laughs> and uh, I was in Scandinavia with somebody and uh, we went on a boat cruise from, where were we, from Oslo to Denmark. Uh -huh. And on the ship, I mean, the family went to sleep and I was like, okay, great, nighttime, let me see, what can I do? So I went up and there's a band playing and uh, they were doing covers and... Uh, but here's the thing, you know what, the sound balance was exquisite. Mm. Uh, very good musicians. And the singer, she was fantastic. And there was something caught my, uh, my ears fancy and I went and met them later and I approached her and I asked her what she's doing. She said, I don't know, I don't want to be on the boat all the time. <laughs> and uh, I was like, you know what, she's good. So I spoke to my wife and I said, you know what, hmm, maybe we should just sign her up. And we did. And next week she came to India. We signed her up. She came to. The, she came by this. The, we started our music festivals, entity this year. So she came to India. She performed, and now we are looking to break her in over here and break her in everywhere. You know, I'm like, uh, I think the record label model is going to go, and the control that they have over radio and other places. It's like we have come to take over now. You know, right. and introduce new yeah. systems. So. Uh, it doesn't matter. So it's like uh, talent. I'm like, I'm scared. Sometimes I have to close my eyes and ears because <laughs> they're just so very great people. And it's like, I, we're not ready to take on everybody. <laughs> She's got the money. So if, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we gone. All the money is gone. Every we need to start making money. So give him your mixtape. <laughs> you, you got a mixtape in here. Everybody got a mixtape. At the end mixtape. of this, don't come storming to the stage <laughs> to uh, <laughs> sing it, Ashish. <laughs> Although if you want to, that would be funny. Um, yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, um, there there is something about, you know, being able to sort of take advantage of just finding the talent where it is, you know, and, and you know, maybe in the past it wasn't maybe that easy to just really make that, that, that cross that bridge to be able to, to get to the talent. So that's really interesting. Um, so, Jordan, what has been your favorite international gig? Um... Uh, I have, well, I think my favorite was, uh, I mean, I've been to London many times, so it wasn't like a new place, but when I went to London uh, with B, it, it was just, the way it happened was really funny, because I knew that they were going on the trip, um, and I didn't think I was going, and I showed up to the studio with her in New York, uh, and I got to the studio, and she's still wearing her jacket, I'm like, okay, what's up, what are we doing, and she, she's like frustrated, she's like, uh, we're going to London, um, all right, we're not gonna work today. Go home and pack your bags. You gotta come. It's like, uh, I had plans this week, but all right, all right. <laughs> so I just went and packed my bag and I went. And, um, and what did you yeah, do in London? Was, and it was just fun. What was really cool about that is we went to a place called, um, uh, well, and I've also been here before, oddly, uh, but a place called Bath. And uh, we were staying up there and then in a little hamlet outside of Bath in you know the rural uh, England, uh, it's a place called Box, and um, it's Peter Gabriel has this amazing studio in a castle, basically, uh, called Real. Uh, is it called Real World Studios, yeah. And uh, and I got to go and work in Peter Gabriel's room, which was amazing because it's in a castle. Uh, yeah, I mean, he had there was two big rooms. So Jay and Kanye were doing Watch the Throne, and and we were doing B's record in the other room, and um, uh, we were in his private room, which was almost like. There's like the main castle-ish area, and then he had his own room, and it's just filled with toys, every instrument you could ever think of. It was like a musician's dream house, uh, and that was really fun. Um, and at that place, they they also have this, um, I don't know if it's an events company or whatever, but uh, they have a f full like chef staff, everything, and they did like this giant dinner at like the King Arthur's table, basically. <laughs> Uh, no, this table was insane. There was 40 people at the table. It was just the longest table I ever saw in my life. <laughs> and, um, and then they say, okay, after dessert, they take you out. And then there was this huge like fireworks show in the middle. And this was like the day I landed. I was like, what is going on right now? This is insane. Epcot Center. Um, yeah, just in the back of a studio in the middle of nowhere. So that was fun. Um, Australia was fun too, uh, for other reasons. Uh, just I'd never been over there, and yeah. you know, 20, 25 hour flight. And well, how does how does the 
location, you know, being in a castle, being surrounded, being in the English countryside, how does that, in, how did that influence your creativity? Or did it have an influence on your creativity? Um, I don't know if it really had an influence on my creativity, but uh, <laughs> it was fun, though. <laughs> he had a good dinner. That's what he's saying. <laughs> long dinner. Yeah. No, it went for a long time. It did. Yeah. But uh, no, it was, it was just fun. It, it, it was just, it was a moment. And I, I got some video and stuff. And yeah, it was a nice uh, sort of moment I remember in my career. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Ashish? Hmm. It's been your favorite. <clears throat> Gig. I got to work on uh, a few uh, unplugged and storyteller sessions in New York. So got to work with uh, James Taylor and uh, did a lot of work at uh, uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center with Wynton Marsalis. So mm -hmm. we recorded him a lot and his big band and the kids band, mm -hmm. which is great. So yeah, those sessions were really fun and really fast. And what were you and doing on those? I was assisting um, the company that I worked with uh, while I was still working with Bruce up in New York. Um, they had a remote recording truck, and uh, they had some fantastic clients. I was the seventh guy they hired in 10 years, and uh, a small company, but they would do the Grammy broadcasts, mm -hmm. uh, they would do the Metallica tours, the U2 tours, anything that of significance on the East Coast, FNL music was there. Yeah. So through them, I got to, I got to go to Dublin. That was great. <coughs> Dublin, uh, we had a 737 pick three of us up from uh, New York, and then we go over to Nashville, and then, uh, oh, and this was great about Nashville. When you land in Nashville, it said 2% employment. Employment, 2%. And I was like, wow. I mean, this is a place where you got unemployment is 2%? I mean, this is too much. And then uh, Guards comes on, and 66 people, we head off to Dublin for a three-day concert tour. Um, it was great. We were out for a week. We set up. So many memorable moments. I mean, outside the country and way outside the country from here. Yeah. So it was good. A lot of tech, a lot of live, a lot of remote recording, and then back in the studio, touch up, and then get the records out. A lot of Guinness. A lot of Guinness. Yeah. We actually practiced. That's interesting you brought that up. I was just in Dublin uh, in November, <laughs> and it's like, yeah. But they said it's either heavy. Jameson or Guinness. Take your pick. Yeah. So they said it's heavy beer. So I said, really? What's heavy beer? Yeah. I mean, now I don't have any alcohol anymore. But... Uh, at that time, my buddy and I, and he took me out and he said, you know, we are going to Dublin, you need to get oriented and you need to get some, uh, uh, some uh, Guinness. I said, okay, so like two, three days, you know, of Guinness mm. after the Guinness, and then I think we were ready for Dublin. So, <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. I've got a lot of stories to tell otherwise, but <laughs> another time. It's like me working in Germany. It was like, oh, I just drink too much beer. Uh, Bryce, how about you? What, did, uh, what was your favorite experience um. so far? Yeah, my favorite experience so far, it was actually just a very, very brief, uh, not even a project. I was actually brought into someone else's project just to kind of help out for a little bit, try to like bring me up to speed a little bit. So it was like only like four days, but it was in Venice. And we weren't, we weren't in like the Venice that, that everyone thinks about when I say Venice, you know, the floating city, you know, half underwater. We were actually just <laughs> north of that in the Venice greater area in a, in a section of town called Marghera. And... That, you know, you, there's land there, you know, we drove to the job site, but this was, a, this was for a cruise ship, so we're in a shipyard. And, um, you know, the shipyard was cool, it was, it was awesome to be on board the ship and, and help out with that, but probably the thing that made it the most awesome was, uh, was the life outside of work, and we were staying at a bed and breakfast, and, but it was like a farm. So I was like sleeping in the barn, and there was like a, a moon roof like in the ceiling right over the bed, so like I would like, turn off the lights and go to sleep and I'd see the stars and I wake up with the sun coming in, open up the, open up the windows and look out back and like, there's nothing. And it's like, pinch me. Like I'm in Venice and the other side of the world. And like, this is so serene and so awesome. And of course the food, it's Italian food, but it's like legit. Like that rooster was crowing this morning and now he's here and he tastes awesome. So <laughs> like it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. It was, it, I mean, when you, when you, when you travel the world and you do all these international projects, it's, it's the life outside of work that makes it worth doing. I agree. So, I mean, even in China, like, you know, there was like a lot of, you know, there's a lot of frustrations with that. You know, the, the culture is just completely different. But all said and done, it's like, we had some really great times because the Chinese, they can drink, let me tell you. And it's so much fun going out and partying with them. <laughs> but it, and it's like any culture is like that. You know, it's the parties that you, that you go to and the friends you make and hanging out outside of work. That's why I like traveling. That's really well said. That's great. 
Well, with that, I think at this time, we have a, a time to take some questions from our audience. So if you have a question for our panelists, please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to, your, uh, brought to you. For those of, of you that are joining us online, please direct your questions to our online moderator who will try to accommodate the questions that you have. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, wait, hold on one second. There's Mike. <laughs> My name is Saquon Johnson, and I'm an entertainment business master's student. I want to know for each of you, who was the most influential individual throughout your career? Um, influential individual in my career? Uh, for me, it was probably my mentor, Duro, who's, uh, who's on campus. Uh, he, he's uh, actually inducting me tonight, so if you get a chance to see him, go, go say hi. Um, I, uh, I really learned everything about not just making records, but also m the music business, because he, he's a, a really successful engineer, mixer, and producer, but he also owns a record company and has done, uh, you know, signed Fabulous and, and done all this stuff. So I, I, got, I really learned 360 degrees all aspects of the music business from him. Uh, and I still learn from him today, and we still have a really close relationship and, and, and work all the time, even though I don't work for him. We, we uh, we choose to work together, which is nice. So, yeah, I'd say Duro. So for everyone. Yeah. Oh, so uh, there's a gentleman back home. His name is Ranjit Barot in India, and uh, I would say he would be my first mentor, not just for music but also for life. So he has a huge appetite and a wonderful vocabulary uh, to express himself musically and sonically. And I met Ranjit when I was like 17. You know. And I'm like 18 now. Anyway, so, <laughs> then, uh, so, so basically, um, I've been with him. Um, and I went to him. He's a fantastic drummer. He tours now with uh, John McLaughlin and The Fourth Dimension. And he's quite a performer. For me, he's like the modern, modern uh, Tony Williams, for those of you who are drummers. And he's wild. And he's such a kind heart. And he took me under his wing, and I started out as a roadie and a hangout with him, and we do everything even today. So he would be, I guess, a huge influencer on my life. Uh, I would have to say, uh, my mentor, friend, colleague, coworker, boss—he's—he's he's all of those things. We—it's—it's it's always the dynamic duo between him and me working on projects. Uh, Evan Hall, he, him and I started our own company together called Forward Thinking Designs, where I am now. And he, he originally hired me straight out of Full Sail. He actually reached out to Career Dev and hired me. And uh, even though I was hired as the project assistant, that was my original title. You know, I wasn't brought in as an engineer or anything impressive. I was hired as an assistant. And he constantly pushed me and drove me to continue learning. And he gave me every opportunity. Even when I failed him, he gave me another opportunity. And he is always pushing me, even now, even now that we have our own company. He still sells me to jobs where I have no idea what I'm doing, but he, he knows that I, can, that I can overcome it. So I think, I think mentors are really important because I think that's for all three of us, that's who's the most influential. Totally. Yeah, very important. Correct. Yeah. I think I think mentors believe in you before you believe in yourself. Absolutely. And that's what Ranjit did for me when I started out, and that's what uh, Bruce uh, did for me much later on. And uh, they continue to do so. And they have this um, uncanny belief in you, and you're like, hmm, really? Hmm, can we do that? And you can. And you know, be, they've been around, and they've been there, and they can help guide you in ways that we cannot imagine. So I think the biggest thing a mentor can do is to believe in you even before you believe in yourself. Any other questions? We have a question from Keisha, who is an MFA student in the Creative Writing Program. She's been uh, uh, very keen throughout our chat session on the South Korean film market. Does anyone have any insights about working in South Korea or uh, the industry there? You know, it's funny is I was in South Korea uh, a year and a half ago, had nothing to do with music, uh, although I did have some, oddly enough, some music friends there uh, who were writing, just happened to be there when I was there. Uh, there actually is a big music scene in South Korea. I was there for another reason, um, so I can't really comment on what's going on musically there. I know that there's 
they buy records and and uh, the business is booming. And in fact, uh, in Korea and also Japan, they they have uh, Ashish and I were talking about this uh, yesterday actually. Uh, they have big labels there that come over to America and look for artists who may not be popping over here, but uh, but those cultures love love American culture. So uh, they try to bring those artists over and, and uh, artists from here have really great careers over there. You may not know them here, but over there they're doing really well. So uh, I know there is a, a great music market there. Uh, funny, funny story. Yeah, K-pop. And uh, uh, I actually had a really interesting story with Korea. I, I went there and and I was with a business partner and and uh, and some hosts. And they took us to this dinner. And I tried this um, uh, live octopus. It's called uh, Sanak Chi. Mm. And uh, literally, they put an octopus on the plate, and it just crawls around. And you got to eat it. It's really strange. Um, it actually didn't taste that bad. So if you get a chance, I. I encourage you to try it. Yeah, I've done jellyfish in China. That's that's a fun, fun. Is it alive? No, no, it's cooked. Uh, it's <laughs> but. Uh, I yeah. got a video. I, mean, I literally have a video on my phone. I'll show you guys. It's on my Instagram. Go just scroll down like a year and a half ago. <laughs> uh, if, wow. That's crazy. If I could add something, I actually um, was sent to uh, the Busan International Film Festival last year in South Korea uh, by Full Sail to represent Full Sail, and I got to meet a lot of the. Uh, prominent um, South Korean filmmakers there. And I have to say that, um, I mean, I knew this before I went, but they have a, a really big market there, both for Western films and um, internally for for South Korean and Korean and Asian films. So, um, so their market is robust. Um, they, uh, you know, they have a lot of influences from India, from Japan, from China. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, influences on their international film uh, market there. Um, but there's a big, big industry there for, for people who are interested in working in, in film. Any other questions? Hello, my name is VT Esther Torres. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank you guys for taking the time out to speak to us today. Um, and we were just speaking about mentors, and I wanted to know, do you, th in all of your opinions, is it something that you seek out a mentor, or you think that's a relationship that just happens organically? You want, uh, I, didn't, I didn't really seek out a mentor. Uh, my first job in New York was an internship at a studio right out of Full Sail. I moved to New York and, and got an internship right away. And I realized at that place it was in a beautiful studio. It was everything I thought I wanted, uh, and and I quickly realized that it wasn't because um, I didn't feel like I was going to learn what I needed to learn there. Even though I, it was it was a great space and and they were working on cool, cool music, whatever, uh, I didn't feel like I was going to learn. And I didn't necessarily attribute it to not having a mentor there or somebody who I felt like could could teach me and and sort of bring me along, uh, but. So I quit, and then and then eventually I connected with Duro and and got that job, and then I realized that's what I was missing. So I didn't I didn't necessarily look for it, but uh, I happened to find it and realized the the value that that it added. I want to I want to follow up on that point because I think at least once for the past two days I've been saying this over and over. Uh, when you when you go through an interview at a company, it's not just the company trying to decide if you're a good candidate. It's your opportunity to decide if the company is a good fit for you as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is, is this a place where I can connect with people? Do I feel like I'm going to be mentored here? It's not just a job. You know, we didn't get on this panel because we just had a job. We have to have people pour into our lives. We have to constantly be learning and improving ourselves. And if someone's not challenging you, then you have just a job. You are not in a career unless if you're always being challenged and always trying to better yourself. And that's a big thing. So my, my mentor just, it kind of just happened because one, you know, I, I was seeking it. I was willing to listen and that's most important. I was willing to listen and I was willing to try to improve myself. And if you're not open to that, if you're not willing or if you're not able to take construct, con constructive criticism, then you're not first in the right position to even be mentored. Now as a, I call, I, 
I want to consider myself a mentor because I seek out other people that I see a lot of potential in, and I really want to. I really want to grow into them. I, I really want them to to really rise to the occasion, and accept a challenge, and I want to help them when I can. So I think it kind of goes both ways. Is there there are mentors out there that that constantly seek out people that they see potential in, but you have to show initiative and you have to show that you have potential and you're willing to go for it. So. I think it's okay if, if you're like in the industry for like, you know, a specific period of time, you know, let's say like a year or whatever, and you're like, you know, I'm just not happy. I'm just doing the job, but like I want to grow. And how do I get to that next step? That what you should be saying is who can mentor me? And that's when you need to start reaching out and, and trying to make friends and being like, dude, I'm sorry. I'm always asking you questions, but you know, I need, you know, I just need someone to, to pour into my life. That's when you can try and find a mentor. And so there's nothing wrong with going out and seeking that if one just doesn't naturally happen. Hmm. I think you use that word seek. So for me, it's, it's like the Zen of, uh, <coughs> the Zen of things. If, uh, if you shall seek, you shall find, but it's not necessary that you're seeking a person but you may be seeking your goal and you do not know how to do it. And uh, it's quite interesting because once you start seeking and you're really hungry for that information, actually you'll see life will provide somebody for you. It happens like that. Wonderful. Any other questions? Oh. We have another YouTube question and this I think is specifically going to be uh, good for Jordan. We have a student, Rico, who is in the music production program and uh, recording engineering, and he is very specific about wanting to work in the Japanese music industry. He knows some people over there, but he, he's wondering about does he have to be sponsored, the logistics of, of getting in there to work in that market. He's an American student? Right. Um, well, uh, yeah, I don't know the process of, of going to Japan, I would, but I would agree if he wants to work in the Japanese market, go where the work is. So figure out how you do that. Uh, one thing I know for sure, because I, I know um, I've met with some of the labels and things like that, uh, Avex, Avex Records in particular is, is a big Japanese label. They have a whole team of people in, in New York and LA uh, that are seeking talent and things like that uh, to utilize for the Japanese market. Um, so, uh, so there might be opportunities locally for the for the Japanese market, right? Uh, but other than that, if, if that's what you want to do, then find a way to get to Japan. And I, I, I'm sure you can do maybe a, a tourist visa for six months or whatever and, and just go and figure it out. Learn the language. Probably learn the language, yeah. yeah. There, there's this element called the leap of faith that I think we all had to take at some point. You're yeah. just scared out of your mind. I have no idea how I'm going to get there. Just do it. You just got to do it. Just yeah. say yes. Yeah. Just say yes. Any other questions? Hi, my name is Mikita, and this question is for Mr. Ashish, but I read online that you were pulled to the States because your parents used to make you listen to ABBA. And Sorry? You know, your parents used to have you listen to ABBA and different American songs, but growing up here in the States, I've actually had the opposite happen where my family has all the... Indian instrumentals, so that's been the pull for me in India. So I wanted to know how able and willing are Indian companies like yours to hire people from abroad? We hire from everywhere, it doesn't matter. And uh, yeah, we're hopefully gonna set up a base here in the coming years, so we're just looking for great people, good energy, great attitude, and it's, it's assumed that you're talented. <laughs> So we are open, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from, and uh, yep. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Justice, I'm in the music production program, and my question is, it's like a two-part question. First off, how do you get over the fear of going outside of the country if you've never embraced any other type of culture physically, and you're going somewhere new for the first time, and also doing that while creating your and building your own business and trying to extend and branch out everywhere. You say how do you, how do you get over the fear? Yeah. Just do it. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I I left Canada. It wasn't really that far. Um, <laughs> Cross the border, basically. Yeah. 
I mean, when I was in New York, it was less than an hour flight to get home. It really wasn't that bad. Um, but the greatest, if I had all the money in the world and I didn't have to work or do anything, I'd still make music because I love it, but I would travel. I would just see everything. Traveling is the most uh, eye-opening experience you can do. I, I love trying new food. I love meeting new people. I love seeing new things. Um, and it really is the greatest uh, part of life to me is going and seeing these things. So, um, you know, I don't know where you came from. I, I uh, fortunate enough, grew up in a family that loved to travel, and my grandfather was a diplomat, and and uh, and and traveled the world and spoke nine languages. And his uh, granddad was in India. What's that? <laughs> his granddad was in India. Wow. Wait, you know that? Yeah, I, I know many <laughs> things. It's my job to know what everybody does. <clears throat> um, so, that's amazing. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I can tell you what your mom did the first couple of years in Delhi. <laughs> oh, yeah. My mom talks a lot. <laughs> Wait, did uh, you talk to her last night? Of course. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, anyways, um, Networking. He knows more about my grandfather than I do. Uh, but anyways, it, it, it was uh, just traveling and seeing the world is, is really the best part of life. So I would encourage you, I don't know where, where, how your upbringing was and if you got a chance to travel, but if you haven't, go and just do it. it it'll be the, the, the greatest decision you've made. Yeah, the probably. furthest I went was Canada because I'm from Rochester. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> well, travel first. Yeah. If you travel, you'll get over the fear. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just go. It's it's fun. U.S. dollar is really strong right now, so you Great can go time. almost yeah. anywhere you want for yeah. pretty cheap. Good. Yeah. Enjoy it while it lasts. Yeah, while it lasts. <laughs> Flights are cheap right yeah, now. Yeah, go now. Yeah. I, I had quite a bit of fear try, trying to travel for the first time, and um, I think that's one of my phobias, really, is unfamiliar places, un, unfamiliar situations. So trying to get through it. I mean, fortunately, the, the plane ride, it's, it's 15 hours from Detroit to Shanghai. So you have plenty of time to like collect yourself and like just, <laughs> just like take it minute by minute. It's like, okay, deep breaths. I'm gonna keep doing this for the next 15 hours and we should get there. And then by the time you watch a couple movies and take about five naps, you know, you land and it's like, oh, it's just an airport. And oh, they, they're, well, I'm six foot four. So, you know, they're a little bit shorter than me. It's like, oh, that's the only thing that's different. It's, you know, just another airport. And, you know, you just kind of, you kind of get through it. And then it's like, wow, I, I made it through customs. I made it through the airport. I'm in a taxi now going to the hotel. Great. It's just like, I made it like, great. The hard part's done. And now just take it minute by minute. And, you know, you can't get ahead of yourself. That's, that's for me. Like I, I always have to slow down. I try to, I sometimes I get all worked up, like thinking about everything that's about to happen on my day tomorrow. And it's like, no, just, let's just relax and, and focus on what's coming on right now. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we have to deal with, you know, life-wise, you know, when you're traveling. But when I go to work, it's game face. Like, I have a job to do. I need to go back to my education. I need to think about what I need to do today. It's a job. And sometimes that, that even, uh, sometimes I've had to tell the client, like, I can't talk to you right now. Like, do not interrupt me. I'm trying to make magic for your for your installation. Like I'm doing my job right now. Get out of my space. So like sometimes that happens. It's like, I have a job to do. I can't think about anything else. There's a lot of stress going on, you know, different languages happening or what have you. No, you know, you have to be able to compartmentalize and you have to be able to know yourself and know your weaknesses. I got plenty of them and I have to face them all the time when I travel, know your weaknesses, but also be able to rely on your strengths. That's the best advice I can give for that situation. Great. One last question. Okay. Uh, I have a question for Jordan. Um, you were where, talking where about. At? I can't see you right now. Oh yeah. Oh. My name okay. is Juan. <coughs> I'm going into the music production degree, and I have a question for you. Um, you were talking about places like New York and LA to get a job for music, but what do you actually think about other places like Miami or Nashville, which are like key places into the music industry. What do you think? I mean, Nashville is a key place if you want to work on that type of music. I, I chose New York because the artists I wanted to work with lived in New York. I recently moved to LA this year because the artists I wanted to work with lived in LA. The songwriters I wanted to work with lived in LA. So go where the work is. If you want to work on country music or rock music or more 
uh, live instrumentation stuff, the best musicians in the world are in Nashville, um, at least for, for those types of things. Uh, you know, if you want to work on, on uh, urban music, uh, Atlanta, Miami to a lesser extent, um, I mean, there's great places in both those cities. Um, I'd say if you want to work in, in pop, urban, like anything uh, top 40, if you will, you need to be in L.A. right now. L.A. is really the one and only market for, for, that, for that stuff. I don't want to say the only market, but there's just so much more things happening in L.A. And the beauty is you have the record companies in L.A. as well. So uh, whereas when you're in Miami, the, the executives aren't there. The A&Rs aren't really in Miami. They show up for the weekend, or they show up for the week, but but uh, they're in and out. So um, yeah, just go where the work is. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, thank you guys, everybody, for attending today's session. We want to especially thank our our guests, Bryce, Jordan, and Ashish, for all of their wonderful stories and knowledge. Thank you guys. Thank you, thank you for having us.